We cannot ignore that we are now 100 meters away from EU institutions. Some of them whose use and abuse of European values are at odds with our vision of what Europe is and what Europe should continue to be. We cannot omit that we are in the capital of a political project that is sometimes part of the solution, but is often the source of the problem, especially as it gets carried away from its sources of legitimacy. Hence, nation states, citizens, and this common European civilization that is so blatantly ignored by those claiming to represent it. Paraphrasing the motto of this conference, let me say that nation states are the future of Europe, but it is not the other way around. Defining European values is a very subtle and complex thing, one I might not be qualified to do, by the way, but at least let me tell you from an EU perspective what those values are not. And in the first place, European values are more, much more than the dry, empty, and generic catalogue of principles enshrined in the EU treaty. No, I'm sorry, but the vague notions of pluralism, non-discrimination, tolerance, justice, solidarity and equality do not even come close to define and grasp our civilization and our heritage. Yet, our elites invoke them like mantras ignoring that they mean little if they are not interpreted at the light of European heritage, culture, and history. And actually, much worse than that, let me tell you what those values are, European values are definitely not. Those abstract notions became the pretext to replace our civilization by a postmodern, disincarnated ideology that is undermining it. And of course, here, I do refer to cancel culture this cultural cancer which is destroying the Western world. And of course here I also refer, I also point at this toxic, evil, and totalitarian woke ideology that is atomizing our societies and reducing us to our sex, our physical features, or our sexual instincts. What an appalling regression this is. Yet, this is one that blithely became the norm of the European Union, one that is constantly promoted and imposed by the European Parliament especially, but also sadly, to my despair, by the European Commission as well. No later than three days ago, hundreds of meters away from here, they organized the so-called EU Anti-Racism Summit, where they celebrated the toxic and false mantras of systemic racism, I'm quoting here, racialized youth, or even environmental racism, whatever that means, in their Orwellian jargon. An event meant and designed to remind us, Europeans, how guilty we are to supposed to feel, how much despair and evil we brought to the world, and how much we must hate and loathe ourselves. Except that we won't. We won't. And finally, what those common values are not, certainly not, are the political we weapons they became. Political weapons to divide us, Europeans, because an arrogant and unabated left shamelessly used them to impose an ideological agenda and to instill discord among us, even in times of war. On the 10th of March, as the Russian army was mercilessly bombarding Mariupol and Kiev, the European Parliament called for immediate financial sanctions against Poland and Hungary for alleged violations of the rule of law. Dear friends, shame. Shame on those 478 members of the European Parliament who found the time to divide Europe while the drums of war are rumbling at our borders. And while Poles and Hungarians welcome millions of refugees. This initiative does not only bring shame on them, history will show us that it will also bring infamy and disgrace. Common values are currently weaponized to intimidate deviant member states, 
and to turn the European Union into a progressist club only. One where conservatives are murdered and silenced. What a paradox that those alleged common values are bringing the EU to the brink of a schism. This is their concept of diversity, a diversity that must be sexual, ethnical, multicultural, or polyamorous, but never political. We must resist this. Thank you. We must resist it because European values are much more than this tyranny of superficial niceness, those prêt-à-penser ethics, and this minority privilege that look, smell, and taste more and more like totalitarianism with an emoji smile. There are enough Justin Trudeaus out there. Huh? We don't need more in Europe. Okay? And we need even less Europe's economic recovery or security to be conditioned to progressist dogmas. So Brussels, release the money you owe to Poland and Hungary, and most importantly, leave our kids alone. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the war in Ukraine is a blast of reality. It might well be for Europe the end of the end of history the moment where it brought, brutally wakes up from its geopolitical nonchalance and eventually decides to stand on its own feet. We might need the European Union to do that. And I must say, I was positively impressed by the resolute and quick reaction that led to adopt the sanctions against Russia, by the use of EU funds to purchase and send weapons, and by the wake-up call to invest much more on defense. This was a promising start. And even if I firmly believe that our security can only be envisaged under NATO's umbrella, I am pretty sure our American friends prefer to count on reliable European partners that take their share and have a greater sense of priorities. Political correctness has geopolitical consequences. We heard a lot about it during the last two days. Its hegemony among European elites is actually symptomatic of the mindset that led them to teach the world lyrical lessons on climate change, on universal values, to close nuclear power plants and cutting off military expensive, why the tragic of history never ever disappeared. The war caught us naked, economically, militarily, and morally naked. While the EU focus, focused on its moral agenda, the world kept going. And that brings me to my third and last point. We see how urgent it is to restore, actually more than to redefine, I would say, to restore our European values. And we also understood by now that this is not the EU's task. It is the sole competence of nation states and its citizens. Let the later restore them and reflect Europe's diversity, its Judeo-Christian roots, its pluralism, and its cultural richness. Nevertheless, there are three core values, three advices that I would like to give to the European Union, three core principles that are important as they are neglected and from which the EU could very much benefit. The first one is the principle of conferral of competences. It is carved in store in the treaty. It's a golden European rule whose ignorance is now triggering a great deal of tensions between EU and its nations, including its constitutional courts. As the treaty clearly states, that's very crystal clear, competences not conferred upon the Union remain with the member states, period. What? The second is the principle of subsidiarity, which is a, really this beautiful intuition that St. Thomas Aquinas brilliantly articulated, and according to which political decisions should be taken as close as possible to the citizens. The EU treaty clearly states and it's even a very nice phrasing that the Union shall act only if and insofar as the objectives cannot be sufficiently achieved by the member states. Is Brussels taking seriously the word and the spirit of this rule? I'll let you answer by yourself this question. And finally, a genuine sense of pragmatism, which is a conservative value that is so often overlooked, although it will be the most useful and efficient compass for a European Union that is lost not only in translation, but also in messianism and political correctness. And yes, to finish, courage, political courage, to resist political pressure and stick to the rules. 
Because the most courageous answer the EU could give when it is asked how it will redefine European values is the following. Sorry, it is none of my business. Thank you.